slides are up. This meeting to order of the Rotary Club of Oakland. I'm Dudley Thompson, president of this club. I'm very honored to serve you. And as I look around, I can't find any of my notes. So I'm just going to wing it here and say it is now the 5,000, I think it's the 5,353rd meeting of the third established Rotary Club of some 36,000 Rotary Clubs in the world. I welcome you to this meeting. Meeting. Uh, if you're on Zoom, um, I would ask that you, we're going to bring it up here, I would ask that you use the speaker view, which is in the upper right hand corner, and in the bottom center there is a chat box. And if you are joining us, please put your name in there, and if you're the guest of somebody, please indicate that, and we will get back to you in a little while and introduce you. Um, I, if you are in the ballroom, I strongly urge you to wear your mask if you're not eating or drinking. The Alameda County guidelines indicate that in, in, uh, inside it is required that we wear masks. And I'm sure after today's meeting, we will, everybody will pull their mask up. Um, this meeting, which is a little different than most of our meetings, will begin with our speaker. Uh, we have... Um, uh, because of the time, she has to uh, go to, she's at University of California, San Francisco, and starts her, um, starts her appointments at 1 o'clock. So we, we're going to skip the, the thought for the day right now. We're going to skip the uh, vision and go right to Peter Shares, who will introduce our speaker, and then we'll come back and hold our club meeting. Thank you and welcome. So uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, I'm afraid that, at least at this point, I do not see our speaker uh, online. Uh, Dr. Gandhi, are you there? Uh, we have communicated with her on a number of occasions. Uh, she just received another email, but our speaker is not available. So. Uh, President okay. Dudley Thompson, how would you like to proceed? I'm really winging it today, folks. <laughs> so, um... Let's, Peter, we had arranged this, and actually, what we're going to do, um, because Dr. Gandhi was only going to be with us until 1 o'clock, and Peter has collected a lot of questions for Dr. Gandhi, and he had indicated to me that there were really a lot of questions, and so I had, in fact, given Peter an extra 10 minutes of club time for himself to uh, address uh, these questions about COVID and the pandemic. For those of you that are new to the club, and, and I'm going to do a little introduction of Peter here. Um, for those of you who are new to the club, Peter is our past president from two years ago. Peter is a retired physician from Kaiser. Uh, and after he retired, he went back to the University of California, Berkeley, and got his master's in public health. Uh, when he was elected to be president of our club for the 2019 to 20 year, uh, he had no idea that he was going to become our doctor. Dr. Fauci. And in many ways, he truly has been. Uh, he was a person at the right time, the right place for our, uh, for our club. Uh, in fact, the last uh, live meeting that we had prior to the pandemic was at the Lake Merritt Breakfast Club. And Peter, it, the pandemic was just starting, questions were just starting. In fact, Mary Jeong is here. If you remember the ship that was held in the Oakland Harbor, Mary got off the ship like two hours, that same ship. She got off two hours before they, uh, they locked it down and everybody stayed on for a month. Uh, and she came to that meeting uh, and nobody got COVID. So thank you, Mary. <laughs> But uh, Peter, and that was really the first time that we began to really appreciate Peter and his role. So I'm going to, Peter, you have a lot of questions there, I think, and we will also take some from the ballroom. And we'll just start with you, and if by any chance, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Gandhi is on now. Dr. Gandhi, uh, we see you. Uh, can you turn your video on? Well, they're doing All right. well, I'm going to go ahead with the, there she is, I'm going to go ahead with the introduction of Dr. Gandhi. Dr. Gandhi was educated at the Harvard Medical School 
uh, and then made the very smart move and came to the University <laughs> of California, San Francisco, where she's been for the last 25 years. She's a professor of medicine and associate chief of the Division of HIV, Infectious Disease, and Global Medicine. She's the director of the AIDS research being done at UCSF, and they are one of the world's best research in HIV. She also runs the HIV clinic there. Her research focuses on low-cost methods of monitoring HIV patients, uh, which is something that I'm very interested in working with my, the hospital I work with in Kenya. Also, she's very interested in women and how to prevent HIV infection and improve the treatment of HIV. And of course, it's become hugely important in her uh, advocacy for the uh, mitigation of COVID-19. Dr. Dr. Gandhi, can we hear you? Yes, you can hear me. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. And so I'd just like to start you off and say, did you ever imagine that you were going to be dealing with this kind of a pandemic with 650,000 deaths in the United States, four and a half million deaths around the world and still growing? No, I think this is uh, very un clearly unprecedented. Um, 1918 was the last time we had anything happen like this. And 1918 was surprisingly worse if you really go back because it was 50 million deaths and there was no vaccine. So we had to get through it with natural immunity. In this case, we have an, a vaccine and then we have vaccine hesitancy and everything that comes along with that. And so um, it, is, it is, yes, it's been very intense and I'm really happy to speak to your group today. Thank you very much. So let me start you out. I'd like you to just sort of, I mentioned where we are with, with you know, 171,000 cases yesterday, another 1,300 deaths yesterday. So tell us a little bit about where we are and where are we headed? I think everybody's sick of this and wants to know. They are sick of it. I completely understand. So, you know, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the immune system. And the reason I wanted to just give you a couple of slides about how the immune system works is because I know it doesn't seem like this, but we actually will get through this. And the reason we will get through this is for two reasons. One is that we have vaccines. And the second is, and I'm not saying this is a good thing, but it happened. This Delta virus is so transmissible that it is finding the unvaccinated and um, it is giving them natural immunity. And because of that, in any place with a mature Delta pandemic, once the cases start coming down, they come down and they come down fast. And that would be, for example, like the UK with higher rates of vaccination, like India, who even had lower rates of vaccination. So it is about immunity to get through a pandemic. The San Francisco and Bay Area cases have already started to come down as of a week ago. California overall, the trends are going down. And I do think we're going to get through this. I do think that 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 COVID, in a way, Delta made it faster uh, in a really terrible way because it gave people immunity. Of course, we want people to get through it with the vaccine. So the reason I wanted to give just a few words on the vaccine is, you know, something very huge happened this week, which was that the first vaccine was approved and not what's called EUA, emergency use authorization. What does that lay the groundwork for? Two things. One is that some people needed this approval by the FDA. It was, you know, just to be, it's understandable. That's what they needed to, and, and a third of people interviewed by the Kaiser Health Network said three out of 10 people who aren't getting the vaccine, I will get the vaccine when it's, when it's approved. We've already seen an uptick in vaccinations literally since Monday. Second is that it will pave the way for vaccine mandates. Um, and vaccine mandates, you, if you can't go back to work, if you can't, go into a setting, if you can't go to that concert without showing your vaccine card, uh, it will increase vaccines. It, the minute France put vaccine mandates and vaccine passports into effect, their vaccine, their hesitancy um, plummeted. Uh, I do want to remind us about and say a few words about the Delta variant. Um, you know, we had this thing called the Alpha variant, and then Beta Gamma really didn't come here. It was really Alpha in March and April, and then we uh, had that, and then unfortunately in June we started getting the Delta variant. The Delta variant is very, very transmissible. It's first identified in India in early March, and 
the thing about remembering how immunity works is, uh, is, is when they tell you that vaccines are waning in effectiveness with Delta, we have to remember how the immune system works to understand that I don't think the messaging is very good around that. So let me explain two arms of the immune system really quickly. Uh, one is called T cells and one is called B cells. And your B cells are the ones that produce antibodies. And antibodies are supposed to go down with time. It's totally natural. In fact, if we kept every antibody in our bloodstream from every vaccine, from every infection we'd ever had, our blood would be thick as paste. So antibodies have been going down over time since we got our vaccines but B cells are primed to produce more antibodies if they see the infection. And interestingly, three papers now show us that if they see the, a variant in the future, they will produce antibodies directed against that variant. And that's what's so profoundly amazing about the immune system. It's very adaptable, it evolves. So I'm not worried about the vaccines ever evading our, a variant ever evading our vaccines, not fundamentally. We may have more mild breakthrough infections, which is happening right now, because what's happening is our antibodies are going down in our nose. But the reason that we're still protected against severe disease is because of this other cell on this page, which are your T cells. Your T cells protect you against severe disease. And the way to explain that is that if this is the spike protein, and this is what is coded for by the vaccine, imagine a spike protein being made of 100 houses, and you have a T cell that covers at night, comes and covers protectively each of those houses. What the Delta variant does for us is it has 13 mutations in it, but there's still 100 T cells along that block of houses. So 13 of those houses turn around and they can't be covered by T cells, but there are still 87 houses on that block that are covered and protected by T cells. So we will, there has been paper after paper that shows us that your T cells cannot be daunted by a variant of just 13 across the spike protein because the T cell response is so in breadth and so robust across the spike protein. So even though we're seeing more mild breakthrough infections, as our antibodies go down, what is supposed to happen is your B cells in your body will, that they will go down, the antibodies will go down, but your memory B cells, when they see that virus again, they will go up again, antibodies will go up again. That's what memory B cells do. And the amazing thing is they'll be adapted towards the variants. So do I think our vaccine variants are gonna evade our vaccines? No, I don't think they ever will. And in fact, um, and I'll just end with this, these are the two reasons memory B cells will produce uh, antibodies adapted against that variant if they see it in the future and memory T cells form in a complex way across the whole spike protein. So getting some mutations along the spike protein can't knock out this profound immune response. So that's why we'll get through it because your vaccines are still gonna have your T cells, your vaccines are, are still do produce B cells in you um, because we've done lymph node biopsies, bone marrow biopsies, people have memory B cells and we need to get more people vaccinated. And sadly, if they don't get vaccinated, they're going to get natural immunity. And I'm not saying that's a good thing, but that's what Delta does. And so when cases start coming down, they come down and we will get through this. Okay, I'm gonna end there and then see your questions. Well, thank, thank you very much. Yes, the, those two systems that we have, sorry about that. Those two systems are very important. And actually you can see it in the data is that even though we had this big spike just recently, which got to half of where the spike was, the deaths have gotten nowhere near as high as That's they right. did in the originally. And all the deaths are occurring, essentially all the deaths are occurring in the unvaccinated. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. So the, so the, the other thing, one other thing I wanted to show you actually that's relevant to what you just said is that, um, is that the CDC keeps track of severe breakthrough infections and they are still remaining completely the same during Delta, meaning um, they are not changing. They are, 
uh, the, the number of severe breakthrough infections is still very low among the fully vaccinated. The majority of people who are hospitalized and dying are sadly people who chose not to get the vaccine, who are eligible for the vaccine. So you are absolutely right that that's what vaccines do, is they're stripping, they strip the virus from its ability. I call it defang. It's defanging the virus from those who are vaccinated from being able to cause severe disease. So why did we have such a Delta spike in this country? The cases went up because it's very transmissible, but the hospitalizations in highly vaccinated places like the Bay Area did not go up anywhere near like where they went up last winter when they would go up with the cases. They stayed lower, much lower than the cases. So that's because of vaccines. All right. The, the other thing that I understand is that the vac vaccinated people, when they do get a breakthrough infection, it's really either asymptomatic or very mildly symptomatic. We had a number of questions, though, from our grand many grandparents in our club. If I get infected, how long am I with a breakthrough? How long am I infectious for? How dangerous am I to my grandkids? OK, this is a great question. So again, I'm actually going to show you a picture because this picture really tells us that you're not as infectious as, um, as you, um, uh, for very long. And let me explain that to you. Um, you are infectious for a shorter period of time than if when you were unvaccinated. So the 10 days is really overkill for someone who is vaccinated. So let me uh, show you a picture of that really quickly so that I, I really show you the data. Um, you're seeing this, correct? Promise, or what do you see? Yeah, it's up. Yes, okay, great. So, um, so when I go to the Delta variant and how transmissible it is, um, uh, you're right that prior to the Delta variant, we didn't think that you could transmit hardly at all if you had uh, a breakthrough infection, or at least it was very hard for you to even get asymptomatic infection in your nose. And what unfortunately the CDC did is I think it gave us really poor messaging on July 27th, when they said vaccinated people are as likely to spread as unvaccinated people. They literally looked at one point in time at the viral loads in people's noses in a Provincetown outbreak and they didn't do follow-up viral load testing to see if it came down more quickly in vaccinated people, which you would expect it to do because your immune response comes in and kills it. And second, they didn't do culture data to see if the virus was really viable, could it infect? So luckily, two other studies came out since they made that announcement. Um, and one was from Singapore in, uh, um, in uh, Delta breakthroughs that showed here's the unvaccinated line here, the red one. And you could see if you do serial viral loads that your viral load comes down very quickly if you're vaccinated and you have a Delta mild symptomatic breakthrough. So probably at least within three days, it's not infectious. And then let me show you one other piece of data that's relevant to that. This is a study in the Netherlands among healthcare workers that had symptomatic Delta breakthroughs. And in this case, they had symptomatic Delta breakthroughs and they cultured the virus when they were symptomatic and they were less likely to be infectious by culture data. That totally makes sense because your immune response is coming in and hobbling that virus, really um, trying to kill it. So it becomes weak and it can't be as infectious. So what do we think is your infectious period? Probably at the most four or four days and that's being conservative. So. Yes, you could get a mild symptomatic breakthrough as an older person, and there are unvaccinated grandkids, but you're not as infectious for 10 days, like you were if you were unvaccinated. All right, so thank you very much. One, one of the questions we got from a number of our members were that, that we, can we expect to see over and over again more and more infectious, potentially even more and more dangerous variants, or, or what is, what's going on here? I do not think so for the following reason. Um, this is as transmissible as a variant as it gets is the Delta variant. 
a variant or a virus cannot keep on evolving and become more virulent and more transmissible and evade our vaccines. There's a concept called viral fitness, where you are hemmed in by the number of mutations that you can get uh, by viral evolution. There was a New Yorker article, I was actually in it, but um, there were many other evolutionary biologists that really um, explained that a virus, if it, if it mutates, it's lost something. It, it, the wild type was the original strain. So it's it, the Delta by being more transmissible may have lost other properties. And it's not gonna keep on mutating and get worse and worse. But I will tell you that this is probably the most transmissible respiratory virus we've seen. I can't imagine one getting more transmissible than this. We gotta get through the Delta. For example, there's a Lambda out there, there's a Delta plus and they never took over. Delta is the one to get through. And when you get through Delta, you're doing very well. And that's unfortunately, India did that. They got through Delta, but they got through it in a very terrible way. Um, they got through it without many vaccines. Only 4% of their population was vaccinated when Delta started hitting. UK got through Delta or is getting through Delta in a highly vaccinated way and their hospitalizations are staying low. Yeah, so I think what you're saying is, is that we all know that evolution is the survival of the fittest. Delta is clearly the most fittest yes, vaccine. And even right. though we've had additional variants, they haven't taken over. They so haven't taken this point. That's exactly the way to put it. That's exactly you got we got the worst one. And this one is gonna, I think, be the one that ends it. And why did it and, and just remember, I don't know, again, it's not a good thing, but why would it end it or why would it make it go down? Because it's going to cause a lot of immunity. That's what transmissible viruses do. Yeah, so there's, there are a lot of questions about booster vaccines. And, uh, you know, what you're saying is, hey, we got a great vaccine. It's stopping us from being hospitalized. It's stopping us from dying. Immunity is increasing. Are we going to be getting boosters? Is it ethical to take boosters away from the rest of the world? So I'll tell you that I don't think it is. I mean, meaning if you really think deeply about the immune system, um, not only are we being protected against severe disease, but those memory B cells will come out and produce antibodies and limit a mild breakthrough. And they'll be directed against the variant. So if I were making this decision, no, I wouldn't have made a decision to give boosters. On the other hand, that's where the United States went. I think they're I think they would have been best focused on unvaccinated people, but they are going to offer these. And um, I fundamentally actually wrote a lot of people and tried to change it, but they didn't listen to me. So um, so what, where would I give boosters? I would give it to immunocompromised patients. And then I think I would still give it to older people with multiple medical conditions. And I know you have older people on this call. And why not? The one good thing about boosters is I don't think it's unsafe. I don't think it's unsafe. And especially if you're at least six months out from your second dose. So I would wait at least six months from your second dose. And then if a booster is being offered and you want, it feels more comfortable, go ahead and get it. But I, I correct. I do not believe it was that. I believe if we got the rest of the world vaccinated, we could get through the pandemic faster and stop having variants. There's been some uh, talk about if you had the COVID, I'm sorry, if you had the Pfizer vaccine, you get the Moderna as a booster, or if you had Johnson and Johnson, you get Pfizer. Uh, what is the data regarding that and uh, how, how do you uh, approach that? You know, this is what, how I think of it. This is from a Mayo Clinic healthcare system data set that showed that reinfection was more common with the Pfizer vaccine than with the Moderna vaccine. Why do I think that that's true? And also why do I think that Israel's worse off than UK, even though Israel had high levels of vaccination? I think the time between the two doses with Pfizer was too short. And a lot of people um, in this country tried to say, please extend the dose interval. It would be better if it was given farther apart. I've never heard of a vaccine that's given every three weeks, but, um, but Israel gave it every three weeks and so did the US. And as you can see, we don't have the UN, um, so, excuse me, we don't see the UK and Canada having this amount of symptomatic breakthroughs. So I would recommend that if you get a booster, if you got the Pfizer, I would actually get the either the Johnson & Johnson or the Moderna. I'm kind of down on the Pfizer after what I saw. It's also the lowest dose and the moderate Moderna is given at a higher interval and people have less reinfection with Moderna. So I would get, if I was, you know, give it to my parents who are 87 and 80, 
Two, I would give them the Moderna if I give them, if they end up getting a booster. And the Johnson & Johnson is good because why it's, it's, it's what they call mix and match, but it's a different mechanism of action. And we've seen that if you, mat, if you mix them, you can even get higher antibodies. And someone just asked, is it dangerous? Again, I don't think it's, it's there's, I don't think there are downsides, but I honestly would wait six months since your, la, your second dose. I wouldn't do it too soon because you don't want a too severe of a antibody reaction. You're, you're good at, you're good at Zoom, uh, Dr. <laughs> I, I could see you popping you up. up. <laughs> <laughs> you picked up a question off the chat. That's very impressive. All right, so the, uh, the Delta variant is way more infectious than the original and even more infectious than the Alpha variant. Does that really should, does that change how we should mitigate against the, the virus, against infection other than vaccination? It, does the six foot still apply? Do masks clearly still apply? Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. What was the exact question? I heard that you said it was more transmissible, but say that again. Yeah, so the, my question is, does that change the other things we do to mitigate transmission? Oh, uh, it's a great, this is all that. Great question. So um, there has not been a variant, including this one, that doesn't respond to what are called, you know, um, uh, NPIs or non-pharmaceutical interventions. So do, um, so do um, uh, uh, masks still work? Yes, they still work. Does, um, uh, do uh, ventilation still works? Yes, they still work. And I have been seeing this interesting um, trend in people trying to put masks back outside, but there was a very good study from the UK uh, that showed that there's no evidence of increased transmissibility even with Delta outside. Outside is as good as it gets. Like ventilate, if you want the best mitigation strategy, especially in good weather, be outside and you don't have to wear a mask. So I don't know where this movement towards outdoor masking is coming in. I would only do that if it was, um, if you're in a very crowded environment outside, like 10,000 people, which is what the San Francisco DPH recommends. All right, thank you very much. Um, there, there were also some questions revolving around how, with this new variant, and if you are vaccinated, are the obese, are people that have underlying medical conditions more likely to become infected or how does that work? So it's a great question. So the, the severe breakthroughs, because um, the, that's what we, we don't want anyone to get sick who had the vaccine. When there was a study of 152 severe breakthroughs uh, in, um, in uh, Israel after the vaccine, and it was either people who are immunocompromised, 40% were immunocompromised, like had a condition that they were taking an immunocompromising drug, or um, the remainder were older with multiple medical conditions. And you are right, obesity is the main one. Because obesity, there's just something about obesity. This virus is very mean uh, in terms of obesity. So that is the number one risk factor for older people. So anyone who's obese, I would recommend a third shot as well. All right, uh, we have, we've had a couple of questions regarding vaccine hesitancy. How, how, how do we deal with this? We've got a little over, I think it's 50% of people in this country are fully vaccinated. We've got a solid 10 or 20% who say they're never gonna take this vaccine. Uh, how, how, do we, how do we change this? Well, I will say that um, there are two ways to do it. One is, I mean, we do need a more compassionate approach because I think, you know, um, there is definitely a lot of anger uh, that we didn't have to have such a bad Delta wave if more people were vaccinated. There was a lot of people are stupid, they're uneducated, they're backward. And, um, you know, in HIV, we learn not to, to speak so uncompassionately. Um, I think we should also acknowledge natural immunity and some people don't want to get the vaccine because they've had infection, which is fair actually in, a, in, our, in um, Israel, Germany, France, Spain, and Italy, you, you don't need to get a shot if you've had the infection, but we have decided not to make that recommendation here and it's pretty different. The third is, is, is passports and mandates. And, you know, um, this country is going towards it and you see it, you see it in your own area. Um, it is, it is, there's precedent for this in this country in 1905. Uh, people weren't taking the smallpox vaccine, and there was a case brought before the Supreme Court called Jacobson versus Massachusetts, 
and uh, they, uh, Massachusetts won, meaning we, it's morally, sorry, legal, legal and ethical to mandate a vaccine. And so I think that's where the country's going. And, um, and if you have to show a vaccine passport to get into that restaurant, that's gonna make you wanna get the vaccine. So unfortunately uh, there's compassion, there's education, and then there's, there's making it happen. All right, and I have uh, one final question. Yeah, I've yes. got about a minute. So our, our members, our members really want to travel. When is it safe for them to travel to Europe? So my parents are coming to see me tonight. They're eighty-seven and eighty-two, um, and I am very, very, very cognizant of the safety of planes. I've studied this. Um, you, I make them wear a very good mask, and the way that they mask is either a surgical plus a cloth or um, one with a filter inside it, like a filter paper, 87 and 82, and uh, fully vaccinated. And um, the turn on the overhead uh, vent, um, but planes have a lot of air circulation. Masking, vent, travel. Peter, can you hear me? Yeah, Peter, can. this is lovely. Um, I, I hate to interrupt. I'm glad to yield Dr. Gandhi another 10 minutes of your time, uh, but I know that our agreement with you is to end at one o'clock so you I can do go. have a talk. Thank, thank you very much, though. It was very nice to talk to all of you. Yeah, one moment, Dr. Dr. Gandhi, one moment. Uh, this year we are highlighting, in honor of your coming today, this year we are highlighting the new Rotary area of focus, the environment. In your honor, we are making a donation to the Environmental Sustainability Thank Rotary you. Action Group uh, towards their focus on biodiversity, sustainable living, pollution, the climate, food systems, and a circular economy. We will also be sending you a copy of our centennial book written by our own Linda Hamilton, which describes our first hundred years of Rotary in Oakland and the world. We really appreciate your coming here today and thank you for giving us your time. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. See you all soon. And thank you for that honor. Thank you. Okay, get back to my no notes. Um, the uh, going around here today, uh, as many of you know, uh, we had and it unrelated to to COVID. Uh, this last two weeks ago, we had this joyous induction of the Oakland Symphony as members of our club, and Michael Morgan was one of those people. Uh, as you recall, Michael couldn't join us that day because he wasn't feeling well. As I'm going to say, as all of you know, sadly, doc, uh, Dr. Morgan, Michael Morgan died last Friday. Um, and in his, do we have his photo there? There we go. Um, as we do for our other fellow Rotarians, I would really like to take a moment of silence in honor of Michael Morgan. Thank you. Um, is when when Oakland Symphony was uh, inducted, I kind of half jokingly said that I, Michael probably has enough of these books to start selling them on eBay. Um, he was a guest speaker at our club, I think three times. Uh, the most recently was maybe last March or so, and we so appreciated him as a, a as a close associate and and his uh, willingness to to come and become a member and we do remember him there is a uh, note that we're passing around if you would just uh, uh, sign your name to it we'd appreciate that we'll send it to the to the symphony um, so we'll go back to our meeting here Ed Shellen um, are you out there I am Ed do you are there any visiting Rotarians out there today yeah, hi, President Dudley and uh, Rotarians. I'm uh, broadcasting here from the uh, Oakland Rotary uh, TV channel. Uh, so I hope you can all see me on TV. Anyway, uh, Dave uh, Kirsten uh, brought a guest with him today. Uh, Brian uh, 
Gabriel, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, that's the only one who checked in. So uh, welcome, Brian. Nice to have you with us. Thank you, Ed. Uh, do you have any other guests out there that signed in today? Do we have Sandeep on? Yes, no? No yeah, guest over here. Yeah, this is Peter. Uh, District Governor Richard Flanders actually uh, came, and uh, I believe he's still on. So thank you for coming, Richard Flanders. Thank you, Dr. Sears. Good. Okay, we have several guests here in the room. Uh, let's start out. Are there any visiting Rotarians here today? I, I'm not aware of any. And we got, they only are here when you come, so you'll have to get back. So Jack McAvoy, would you, past president Jack McAvoy, would you, I'm trying to honor you here. That's good, I appreciate that. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor again to introduce Phil Holt, who's the principal of Sunbelt um, Brokerage, Business Brokerage. He's a six-year member of the Alameda Club, and he's moving. He's doing the opposite of David Stein. He's moving from Alameda to Oakland. So, welcome. And I know that Phil has filled out an application and has been interviewed. So we welcome you to the club, Wendy Howard. Friends, it's a pleasure to reintroduce his second visit, Kevin Hunter, Vice President of Johnstone Supply. <laughs> Uh, five branches throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. Right, I'm sorry, Fred, Fred, you got it over there first. Or... Uh, so my guest today is uh, Jason Toro, who is the Director of Diversion and Reentry Services at the uh, Alliance for Community Wellness. Welcome. Jason Weiselman, you have the mic now. My lovely guest is Catherine Kurlacki, professional organizer and all around amazing person. A very uh, a special relationship with the bells. Yeah. If you couldn't understand through the mask, uh, he was saying that Jim Bell and Bonnie Bell are, uh, has a very good relationship, and Jim was a very longtime member of our club. Uh, Lorna Padilla Marcus. Thank you, President Dudley and fellow Rotarians. It's my pleasure to introduce Jason Smith of Pelocity, a payroll processing company. Uh, he's located in uh, Oakland and uh, is checking out Rotary. Thank you. So I, I think under that mask is Derek Johnson. Is that right? Yes. How are you doing? Hello. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. So I have, well, I have a guest, Regina Jackson. We went to actual high school together, Bishop O'Dowd. And she's visiting from East Oakland Youth Development Center in East Oakland. And we have a brand new Rotarian, her first meeting, and she actually joined the club. I know, I'm so Hello, Regina. Hello, Regina. Hi, 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 Regina. Hi,
I do have that in my notes, but let's do it here. Right? Uh, let's do it here. Let's do it here. I've got a quick thought of the day. Uh, there's my thought of the day up on the screen. You really never realize what you have till it's gone. Toilet paper is a good example. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. And, and we'll follow that up with a less serious note. Let's, can we recite our vision, the Rotary International Vision Statement? Can we bring that up? Thank you. Uh, together, we see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. I don't know whether Garfield or that is more important right now. Anyway, um, so Mark, uh, can you come back up here? And we have a Mark and Tom show here today. This is like old times. I like old times. Some of you remember the. Uh, what is it? The uh, 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 help me. The the uh, Don, and uh, Don, and Dan. Don and Dan show. Uh, these these are gonna. They don't even remember the Don and Dan. Mark, <laughs> <Mario, laughs> what side do you want? You want this side? Yeah. What side do you want? We do this all the time. This is like Laurel and Hardy, really. Um, well, this is High Adventure time. And we're here to present, present and make sure you're aware of certain activities we have going. I'm going to do cycling. And this is for this Sunday. We're going to do a short 27 mile ride. Uh, we're going to be leaving uh, out in Martinez. That's a long way. So how long does that take you? Well, we stop along the line way and we have food and we make jokes and we have a potty break, one or two, uh, about three and a half hours. But what we're going to do is we're going to leave near the John Muir house. We're going to go up into Crockett. Crockett, we cross the Cartinas Bridge. From there, we go into Benicia, where we hit the local bakery. And that's really Mike Malone's hangout. And uh, we spend some time there. And then we get back on our bikes. We go across the Benicia Bridge. And we go back home very leisurely bike ride. The average, I would say, the speed of the bikes is between eight to 10 miles an hour. So, and no one really gets too exhausted. Shannon, is that correct? Easy. And easy. easy. And Fred, isn't that correct? Yes. Yeah, and easy. Steve Blair is going to be with us. So we've got a lot of good Rotarians. We've got people coming. We start at 8.30 to meet up, ready to ride by nine. It's up on the Rotary website. So please cycle your bike, meet us. If you need directions or you need to get your bike over to Martinez, let me know. All right. There you go. All right. And what else? Coming up, we have a new event in September. It's the Oakland Roots versus LA Galaxy on September 18th at five o'clock. Uh, a link to purchase tickets will be up on the website shortly. We have 50 tickets. We have 50 tickets that are literally on the field. And we would, we're, we're, we have the hope mentees coming, but I also encourage all of you to think of who else you could invite to engage with and bring into our community. We have Cerrone Lena, we have speech contest, we have Interact, Rotaract, Enterprise. Let's, let's fill those seats with a lot of young people and a lot of you. So we would love to see Tom, you. Are the Roots the bowling team for Oakland? So yeah, so we lost two teams, but we gained one and it's the most popular sport in the world. It's soccer, so. As Susan, Vaughn, Susan would know, she was an all-star high school player playing on the men's varsity team. Really? Yep, in high school. I remember that. Wow. She was more than that. She's professional. She's professional. Okay. Um, and then also we've been contacted by the Warriors who are already outreaching to do group ticket sales. So I'm trying to find out what sort of levels they're looking at, but that, that's to come in the, net, in the coming year. And then also, as you all probably have seen my emails, we do have an A's Yankees game tomorrow. So we still have six tickets available. Tickets are $80. These are prime seats literally on the field. And it's, they're not regular seats. You can, you can move around, plenty of room to social distance. They're premium seats, trust me. Uh, so we have, we have six tickets available. You can go online to the calendar page, the events page on our website. And I'm going off the script, Beverly, but we have 
a generous donor, Alex Paulson cannot attend tomorrow. And so he would like to auction off his tickets and donate the proceeds to ORE. So if we can begin, Dudley, would you like to do this? Maybe we start the bidding at $60. For How about $60? Is somebody, so let me add this. We have six tickets left. This is a seventh ticket. I'm going, today, actually, I bought a couple of extra tickets. We're gonna donate them to Rotoract or other folks that Tom can give them to. So if somebody, if you can't go or the like, you know, somebody give us 60 bucks because I'm gonna, the next tickets go for 80. So, but somebody start off with $60 for a ticket. Shannon, for two, for two tickets. My goodness. $160 value. $160 value. We got, we got $60 for $160 value. How about that? How about $80? Come on, somebody give $80 for two tickets. If you make a donation, it's going to cost you 160. So, okay, $60 it is. Thank you, Shannon. And so that means there are still six tickets left. Again, talk with Tom if you're willing to buy a couple, a ticket or two, and give them to Rotaract or some of the other students we deal with. Right. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Hi, right. don't we have a special show tomorrow night? Oh, okay. no. yeah. So uh, one of the bonuses for the A's game is a laser drone light show, Star Wars theme. So it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's the first time it's been done. Thank you, Tom. President so, Dudley, before yes. Mark gets off the podium, I'd like to ring the bell in his honor. I have a bit of a fish story. So Mark and I had a chance to go salmon fishing on Sunday, and Mark won the biggest fish pool. He split with somebody else, and off his pole, he caught five fish. How did he do it? He slept through the whole thing. <laughs> this is for you, Mark. That's true. Florida Padilla, Mark. Lauren Padilla, Mark, that's rings the bell for Mark Rose. For those we of you have some online bell ringers. Oh, we have some, off, there's some offline bell ringers. Do I hear that, Sandeepa? Yes, there are online bell ringers. We are not offline. They are not offline, they're online. They, they are, thank you. Who is it? So we, um, let me take a look. We have Steve Nicholas uh, ringing the bell uh, in the memory of Michael Morgan. Thank you. Ruth Strop ringing the bell in the memory of Michael Morgan. And Shanna O'Hare is ringing the bell in the memory of Michael Morgan. And that's it. Thank you, Sandeepa. Uh, for those of you that are new, a bell ringer is a generous $100 donation to the Oakland Rotary Endowment. So, Peter, we have some extra time here, maybe about five to ten minutes. Uh, are you still online? I am still online. Did I come through? There we go. Peter, since I have the microphone, I am going to get my question in. Um, I have a question about flu shots coming up in relation to uh, booster shots. Uh, can you get them together? Do you separate them? It, should a flu shot be a higher priority? What's your opinion? Um, I think, well, in, in terms of your last question uh, and in the discussion that we had today, where the we know that these the vaccinations we've had for COVID are incredibly still and remain very effective against hospitalization and death. And so uh, what I would suggest is if, flu, if the booster shots are not available or if you choose not to get a booster shot, save that vaccine for someone else in the world who doesn't have any vaccination, then flu shot is actually more important for you because uh, you, don't have any, you don't have immunity against the flu that's gonna hit us next year. So what other questions do you have out there? I'll just turn it over to you. Um, well, I'm not seeing a lot of questions. I think the most important thing that she talked about, and I'm not, there may be questions regarding the two different kinds of immunity we have, that the T cells and the memory B cells, those cells are able to respond incredibly quickly to a, an infection that they sort of recognize from previous. And so that's why the, it, that's why these vaccines are so effective against serious illness and death. Um, I thought that her uh, thoughts about travel uh, concentrated on airplanes. Um, 
Airplanes actually probably are not a huge source of transmission. Again, for the reasons that she said, number one, people are tested before they get on the airplane. Number two, everybody's supposed to wear a mask. Number three, they have HEPA filters. There's very, very intense filtration of the air, airliner air. So the risk to travel isn't so much the airplane. It's actually once you get there and, and the community spread that's occurring in the place you go. So um, I'm happy to respond to any other questions I see in the chat. Uh, what, I will, what I would like to show, let me actually show one thing, which is, I think is in a terribly important slide. I'm going to bring up uh, quickly, quickly, come on, uh, pages, pages, here we go. One of the things that this, what this slide shows is the number of cases in the different areas of the country since February 2020 to today. And look at Mississippi. Mississippi, which has a very low vaccination rate, has five times the number of cases that are occurring here in California. We're down here. Alameda County, California overall is 35. Alameda County is 26 cases per 100,000. So we are very fortunate here in, uh, in, uh, in California and in Alameda County. The other thing I want to show is this slide. So this is the excess deaths that have occurred since the COVID epidemic began, beginning again in February 2020, going through that first wave that we had in the Northeast, the big wave that we had last winter. And now we're actually beginning to see this increased number of deaths. But what's important are these three, is the three curves, the purple, the green, and the red. The red is the anticipated uh, deaths. If uh, people are not responding, they're not social distancing, they're not wearing masks. But the purple line is what would happen if everybody wore masks whenever they left the house. It is incredibly important that we try to maintain that, those masks because they can have a huge impact on our deaths. This has been true throughout the epidemic, any place along here. If we got 100% masking, the deaths would have dropped off. So masks could have saved hundreds of thousands of lives. Uh, let me see, let me get out of this. Let me stop sharing and go back to the questions. Um, Peter. Did our speaker say if you want a booster, it's good to get a different vaccine than your original? And if she did, do you agree? Uh, she did. What she said was, is that getting a different vaccine, especially if you originally got the Pfizer vaccine, which appears not to be quite as good as the Moderna vaccine, she did say that you can get some uh, benefit. I don't know what the recommendation is going to be. Um, and I don't, I, we're still waiting for the data, so I, I can't tell you what's going to happen, what's going to be available to you, or what's going to be recommended. Um, the point is, is that it, it probably doesn't really matter. If you get another vaccine, you're going to get a boost in those antibodies. If you get infected with a, with a, uh, with a, with a, a breakthrough case, you're going to get a boost in your antibodies. Um, and I think what she really said was that she doesn't actually think boosters are going to change the effectiveness of vaccines against serious illness or death. So that, uh, that's, that's the best answer I can give there. Dudley, do you have any other questions? Dudley, you've... Uh, I think oh, they've, they have frozen. frozen. Yeah, they froze in the, uh, in the ballroom. <clears throat> All right, well, the ballroom's frozen. There we go. Uh, so the ballroom is frozen. Anybody else want to go to the chat while uh, I will answer questions? What about kids? So the, the problem with kids is that, of course, you don't want to give a child something that's actually going to make them sick. So the FDA is going to be incredibly careful to be absolutely sure that they cover all the T's and dot all the I's and make sure that these vaccines are perfectly safe for children, that there's absolutely no evidence that they're going to get into trouble. I do not expect approval for vaccine. Get rid of a past president. Now you're back. Now you're back. You guys froze. That's why I'm talking. So anyway, I don't expect the final approval for the kids' vaccines to occur until the end of the year or the beginning of next year. 
There you go, Dudley, you're back. You're not frozen anymore. Peter, you missed us thanking you profusely and clapping. We gave you a standing ovation. We danced in the room for you and we celebrated your presidency. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> you're welcome. I enjoyed it. So uh, on the 9th, uh, the 16th and the 23rd, we will be in the ballroom. Uh, the 9th, we're going to, uh, I'll just tease it a little bit. We'll have the Dean of the uh, University of California School of Law with us. Um, and then the 16th, 23rd will be here. The 29th will be the first five collaborative meeting. It will be on a Wednesday and it will be all Zoom. Uh, we're working on that meeting, but it, uh, we do about two of these a year. Again, if you're new, the first five clubs go uh san francisco we oakland is number three seattle is number four and los angeles is number five and for the last two years we've been talking and putting on programs and doing joint projects together so we will have a joint meeting on september 29th robert yes Dudley. so what's going to happen next week deadly is possible when you go home today it's possible in real time to watch the unfolding of the afghan war uh that's supposed to be over at least our involvement on august 31st on september 2nd here at rotary number three we will welcome uh asia wahab asia is a city councilwoman in the city of hayward she is uh, renowned uh, in america as being the first afghan american to have been elected to high office here in the united states but more than that, she's a member of the Afghan community here in the East Bay. She'll be talking about the impact of the war on that community and what it's going to look like when the war is over. Next week, Aisha Wahab, right here at Rotary Number 3. Thank you, Robert. So, um, do we have raffle tickets back there? There's a box. Oh, you've got, I put a box. I don't care. You put them in a box. I'm going to have... Um, how about Lorna? Lorna looks like an honest person. Would you be willing to, Lorna, would you be willing to pick a raffle ticket? And we'll know just how honest you are if you pick your own ticket. We'll look too deep. Okay. And the winning number is 509632. 632. <laughs> <laughs> David Kirsten. Okay, this is great. Davis has now won two weeks in a row. <laughs> You'll have to show your ticket, David. <laughs> so, folks, um, I do know that next time we do an auction, I'm going to get Lorna up here. Those tickets would not have gone for $60 if Lorna had been auctioning them off. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you all for coming today. Um, I want to thank uh, Mark Rosen and Tom, Mark for the Thought for the Day and the Tom and Mark show. I want to thank Peter so much for uh, arranging for Dr. Monica Gandhi to be here and for Dr. Gandhi. Uh, Ed Jellen, it's always a pleasure to have you come in on your television screen. Um, and Robert Kidd for pitching next week's meeting. Um, it's special being here at Rotary. It's so nice to be back in the ballroom to have you here. Uh, we had uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a reception that started at 1130, trying to encourage people to come a little bit earlier and to visit. Uh, and Jack, this is going to be a surprise. We're not going to do it at 1130. But when we start coming back, we will have another reception here. So uh, it's just finger food. You know, it's not going to supplant your, your sandwich. But uh, we encourage you to come about 12 and so you have time to visit with us other people. So folks, uh, I don't have my notes. I know that I often say service above self. Don't keep Rotary a secret. We're Rotary. Folks, this meeting of the Rotary Club of Oakland is adjourned.